Morning again. You're stuck with me one more time. It's nice actually being in a group of experience in California preparing for our breakup with Elsevier and the way we are communicating and dealing with alternative access. Uh, Colleen's following me and is going to be uh, diving into more details about data analysis and some of the tools and various other things uh, and also from uh, particularly from their experience in Germany. Um, alternative access when you, I, oh, one other thing I wanted to say at the beginning actually, so let me just hide that for a second, is uh, in a way it feels, I, I suspect you know all of these things because all libraries of course don't subscribe to everything and particularly uh, smaller universities, lesser funded universities have lots of things they don't subscribe to and so we all deal with alternative access all the time. Um, the difference here, at least for us, is that we are now going to lose access to a very major resource that our faculty and students are used to having. So it's a bit different than the usual. We never subscribed in the first place and we have to find ways to get access for folks. But uh, how do we deal with losing one of our major resources for people who are quite used to having it? Um, alternative access, first of all, is critical negotiation leverage. We're talking a lot about uh, going into negotiations over transformative agreements with publishers. And the uh, put transformative agreements are tending to push publishers out of their comfort zones. And we heard about that from Wiley yesterday in a very uh, uh, powerful and effective presentation about how it took a mindset change for them to engage as actively as they have recently in transformative agreements. Um, both sides can benefit from transformative agreements. I'm convinced. I think these can go forward as partnerships. I think we can help the publishing industry move forward. At the same time, we're helping serve our patrons uh, better with open access and, and uh, the rest of the world as well. But at some point in a negotiation, we may want something more than the publishers are willing to give. And then the question is, how do we apply pressure and who's going to win that dispute? Or how are we going to come together so that we perhaps find a win-win, but in any case, there may be a point where we just aren't agreeing. Um, bargaining power very heavily depends on the obvious thing, your willingness to walk away from the bargaining table. If you're not willing to walk away, then the other, and the other side knows that or suspects that, then ultimately they can just stand firm and not move a bit until you finally give up, uh, sometimes called a war of attrition, uh, and sign up for what they're offering you. If you're not willing to walk away, you have very little power ultimately in the bargaining. Uh, there are other things, it's not the only thing, but it's certainly one of the major forms of leverage that we have. So thinking about what the alternative is to actually entering a new subscription, known in the bargaining in the negotiation or bargaining literature as the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. If you don't get an agreement, what are you going to do? is really critical. And we recognize that as we adopted our new strategy last year to start negotiating transformative agreements with publishers, we realized, especially with some publishers who have very little interest in transformative agreements at this point, that if we weren't prepared to walk away, we would probably not make as much progress as we hope to make. So we, from the very beginning, started analyzing our alternatives and thinking about what uh, we could do. At the same time, alternative access is crucial service delivery. Uh, after all, our, our primary business, if you will, the thing we spend most of our time on in libraries is making access easy and quick and uh, usable for our patrons, for our faculty and our students, particularly in universities. Canceling a big subscription contract hurts our patrons. There's no question about that. That's not what we normally like to do. It is not our job to hurt our users uh, and to make it more difficult for them to get access to material. So there's a, there's a real tension here. On the one hand, we're trying to get something that we think is good for our institutions and good for the world, open access through transformative agreements. That's the long-term goal, if you will, the future that we're trying to work towards. But in the short term, our job is to provide access. And if we have to threaten and possibly go through with walking away from an agreement to get the long-term goal, we're hurting our users in the short term. And there's a balancing there. We have to decide, is it worth it? And can we provide good enough short-term access through alternative means that our users won't suffer too much and make it worthwhile pushing for the long-term goal? Or do we have to give up on the long-term goal in order to satisfy the short-term needs? So we have this tension and alternative access is crucial to both. We need to really think carefully about what we can do, how we can do it, how well we can do it, 
uh, and then uh, keep track of what we're doing. So to develop our alternative access strategy, um, we basically did four things. We assessed our current capacity and practices. What do we do for things that we don't subscribe to, uh, that we don't have? What are our current practices to support our faculty and students, and how successful are those? Uh, then we planned ahead for the cutoff. We started our planning, I think, in September of last year, while we were still in negotiations. It wasn't that we had decided from the very beginning we were going to walk away, not at all. We were serious about reaching an agreement as long as it was an, an acceptable agreement, but we knew that we might have to walk away, and so we began planning uh, last September for that possibility. Then communicate. Uh, before any decision is taken, start communicating to people because they knew we were in negotiations, they knew we were asking for something dramatic. By they, I mean our faculty and our students. We, started to, we had to communicate to them what we were going to do in the case that we didn't reach an agreement, and then of course after we terminated negotiations, we had to communicate more. Uh, and then we are going to assess so that we can improve our experience after the cutoff, which as I mentioned, has not quite happened. We expect it very soon, but it hasn't actually happened. In Germany it has, so you hear more about that from Colleen. Uh, but we have to put in place a plan right from the beginning. In fact, before the beginning, we need to measure a baseline. What is the service we're providing currently on access to Elsevier articles? And then be ready to immediately measure both quantitatively and qualitatively what kind of service we're providing afterwards and assess how well we're doing with our different strategies for alternative access so that we can improve that over time if need be, depending on how long we go without a uh, contract. So now I'm just going to go through the recommendations we make in the toolkit I told you about yesterday, which is available online. And again, I encourage all of you interested to get it. It's terse and uh, to the point. Um, we have some specific recommendations or alternative access based on our experience to date and our planning. And we uh, think that this suggests a good way to go forward. It's also based on our observation about what others have done. Um, first thing is to simplify the messaging and the approach to alternative access. Our first draft, uh, we, we put together a, a team, a task force on alternative access last September, and they came back uh, towards the end of the our fall, sorry, I keep doing that. They came back towards uh, early December and with a recommended alternative access plan. It was, uh, what they recommended was that we put up a web page specific to this problem, and they gave us draft text, which was, oh, about that big, about 10 paragraphs. Uh, it had about four different lists of resources, about 30 different resources with links and so forth. It was written by librarians, for librarians. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, it was a lot of detail. Um, our users don't want 10 paragraphs and 30 different links. They're used to going to Science Direct and clicking and getting immediately. They want something simple. They don't want to learn to become librarians. They want to know the, the easy way. So we simplified it down to basically just three strategies. There are four bubbles here, but two of them are really addressing the same thing. One is go find an open access copy if it exists. For about 15% of Elsevier's publications, as I recall, uh, there's a hybrid open access copy or it's a full open access journal. So that's already cutting off a chunk of content right there that's available open access. Uh, then there are the author's preprints on servers uh, that are easy to find. We basically suggested two strategies. Put the unpaywall button or, uh, on your browser so that you can immediately find out if there's an open access copy available, or use Google Scholar, which all of our faculty and students do anyway to find things. And Google Scholar is really quite good now at telling you where you can find things uh, on preprint servers. So as simple as that, go look for an open access copy. That really should be everybody's first step, and that's what we recommend first, because instead of the 30 seconds it takes to go into Science Direct and click on the article and get it, it might take 60 seconds to go to Google Scholar, click on the article and get it. It's going to be almost as immediate if it's available. Uh, it may not be available, but that's certainly the first step. Uh, then we suggest um, asking the author. Uh, in many cases, the authors are easy to find these days. You often know them because they're in your field and you've met them at conferences. Uh, ResearchGate and Academia.edu, one of the very valuable services they provide is a messaging service. So many scholars now have registered with one or both of those. And even if they don't make their email address publicly findable very easily, you can message them within those services. And I'll tell you as an author, and I'm sure those of you who have authored feel the same way, when somebody asks you for something you've written, you're usually pretty happy to send it. You'd really like the idea that somebody wants to read your writing. Um, there's also a nice feedback loop there I'd like to mention. Suppose that there are a lot of requests for an article to an author and it gets sort of to clutter up their inbox and they're getting a little bit irritated. The good news is 
that they're finding out the advantages of open access. That if it were available open access and they published it open access, they wouldn't get everybody writing to them an email and asking them to send a copy. So there's actually an advantage there too. And then finally, and we don't necessarily mean this finally in the sense of go away, don't bother us, but it really probably is the last resort and that it may be the slowest, is ask the library. Depends on what services you have set up. Um, our interlibrary loan service, we can get some things within four hours. We get about half of requests filled for articles since it's electronic delivery. We get about half filled within 24 hours and the rest, it takes a bit longer depending on uh, what it is. Um, so it takes a bit of time, but we can get things through interlibrary loan or we can buy them through document delivery services. Um, that's spending money, but of course we're saving money on the subscription we're not paying for, and we can use those savings to help cover the cost of purchasing some articles. Not all of them, because obviously it's more expensive to buy by the article, or we wouldn't have subscriptions in the first place, but we can do some of that. So that's it, open access, ask the author, go to the library, and of course go to the library through a quick link and a quick form fill out. Those three things are our messages, and we think it's really important to keep that simple. Second, raise awareness of your library's interlibrary loan service. Um, different libraries have different experiences, but we've learned through uh, some of our faculty surveys over the years and through uh, various types of feedback we gather in other ways, that most of our faculty really don't know about interlibrary loan anymore. Um, the older generation, my age, uh, certainly does. We used it a lot. But nowadays, so much is available online, uh, and so much is available from the library, at least a large comprehensive library like we have at Berkeley, that an awful lot of people never use interlibrary loan, particularly in the younger generations. So we need to actually let them know what it is and that it's there. That ask the library means we can get it for you even if we don't subscribe to it. We can get you a copy through one mechanism or another. So actually advertising that uh, is very important. Oh, uh, the other thing I was going to mention on that quickly is that uh, we have a link resolver for the system, the University of California system, which covers all of our 10 separate university campus library systems. Um, and we've programmed that link resolver to present a different set of information to people about what happens if they can't get an Elsevier article. So as soon as the cutoff occurs, we're going to turn that on. So as soon as somebody requests something from Elsevier, if it's not available, if it's in the set of things that's not available, they'll be directed to a different workflow essentially that we've programmed into our link resolver and be given special information and treatment about how to do that. So we communicate that, in particular how to communicate with the library to get support for that. So that we can give special expedited service and also help those people who aren't used to having to go through interlibrary loan to get materials, give them special treatment basically so that they um, are addressed and they're uh, better educated. Uh, consider strategies to expedite service. I mentioned our rough pattern of service response on uh, requests to the library. There are various ways to speed that up. The fastest way is to pay for document delivery. Buy the article directly from a service. You can set that up with various services so that it can happen within an hour or less even that the document's delivered uh, if the user is allowed to communicate with them directly through you. But that costs money. Uh, there are other ways that cost somewhat less money. There are uh, various services. I don't know what's available here, but for instance, um, Rapid ILL is one that is a service that you pay a membership fee to, so there's an upfront cost, but then it accelerates the speed of delivery. It's a group of libraries that have joined in a membership to accelerate interlibrary loan deliveries to each other, and although it costs something, again, if you've canceled a contract, you're saving money on that, and you might want to invest some of that money in, ex in a more accelerated or expedited ILL tool. Um, employee data and pilots and planning, and I think Colleen's going to talk about this a fair bit. Um, we knew that usage data on interlibrary loan or requests for articles uh, from our traditional um, ILL service was not going to be very helpful because we have contracts with all the major publishers, or we did until we canceled the Elsevier one. So finding out uh, for wh what type of demand there is and how we respond to it for the smaller, more obscure, less popular publishers really wasn't going to inform us about what's going to happen when we don't have access to Elsevier um, or any other major publisher. But some others don't have access to Elsevier, either have canceled their big deal and just subscribed to a few individual titles, uh, or have canceled their big deal and subscribed to nothing. Um, so we were communicating with other institutions that have been without Elsevier service and getting data from them and learning from them, um, as well as uh, doing analysis of our own historical usage. So we knew what the historical demand for downloads of Elsevier articles were for us. 
And then we used that with the types of responses that other libraries were getting in terms of particularly how many requests came into the library for help. And something we found very consistently across uh, Caltech, uh, California Institute of Technology, which is a separate institution that canceled its big deal a couple of years ago and went to a much shorter list of titles. Uh, the German Deal Group uh, uh, with help from the Max Planck Society and the Swedish Consortium. Pretty consistently, it seems that people are finding that about 5 to 10 percent of demand measured by counter is what's coming to the library for help. Um, so a pretty small fraction of the total number of downloads. That suggests that people are finding other routes like open access copies or preprints to get to the articles they want before they turn to the library, which gives you a sense of how much demand there will be on your ILL service and how many people you need to put on or how much time you need to schedule for it. Um, it's it's non-trivial because Elsevier, a lot of articles, a lot of download, uh, so we're going to have significant demand, but it's not going to be 100% of the demand and we expect it to be about 5 to 10%, um, which is very useful. We did, we were able to figure that out with data from us and data from others. Um, the pilots, um, we have, the, as a consortium, we have, again, 10 independent campuses with 10 independent library systems that do things not always the same way. So we're actually implementing some different tools. Some of our campuses have subscribed to Rapid ILL. Some have not. Some are going to provide unmediated access to document delivery that faculty can automatically get purchased articles of a certain number of uh, copy articles a month that the library will pay for without the library vetting it or approving it. So they get basically inch and push button access. Other campuses aren't doing that. So we're trying different things on different campuses so that we can assess what works, what doesn't work, and then compare those results and decide how to move forward across our campuses. <coughs> Develop a communications plan, something I repeat with every topic because we think it's essential to every topic. Um, we've got an alt access web page. It's much stripped down from that original propo uh, proposal from the task force. Uh, we published it well before because we wanted to reassure the faculty and students. We point to it all the time and say, if and when the cutoff comes, if before we cancel the contract, when, since we cancel the contract, uh, here's where you can go. Uh, and we make it very easy to find um, and refer reference it all the time to give people that guidance on how to get help on finding these articles. Um, we discuss it during every one of our outreach uh, activities. When we have town halls, we always talk about alternative access. When we send out broadcast emails on our web pages, when we talk to the media, that's one of the big things uh, that comes up and shows up in lots of the published articles about what we've been going through. Um, we also always plan and coordinate our, our communications to continually remind our patrons that this is a joint effort by the libraries, by the academic Senate, by the faculty, and by the administration. So we do joint communications. We have consistent messaging from all of those sources to remind people that we're going to, we have their back. We're going to do the best to support everybody as we can, but it's a joint effort. It's not just the libraries doing this to you. We want to, everybody to remember that the faculty leadership and the administrative leadership all agree that this is the best thing right now for our university. Here is our plan for, gosh, today? Tomorrow? Tomorrow. Um, which, by the way, is out of date already because last night it changed, but I didn't have time to update the slides. Uh, but to give you an idea of our communications plan um, and how detailed it is down to the timing of things, both the sequence and when things are going to happen, these, we were planning to do a major announcement because we thought the cutoff was happening this weekend. We now think it's happening after July 4th, which is a major holiday in the U.S. Um, so uh, we're, we changed the plan last night, but this gives you a quick idea of all the different ways in which we're communicating, the sequencing, the coordination between a letter from the Academic Senate, the faculty, that's going to be the first thing that actually goes out publicly. The very first thing is the faculty saying to the faculty, this is what's happening, we're behind it, don't panic. Uh, and then we're our, our websites, distributing announcements through email, we're contacting the media who keep asking us what's going on, when are they cutting you off, what are you going to do when they do, so we're letting our media contacts know and so forth. Final thing uh, in the uh, recommendations is to commit to ongoing assessment and planning, to do that baseline data collection, to set up your data collection, both qualitative and quantitative, for post cutoff, and be prepared to figure out what impact this is having on your users as quickly as possible with as much 
detail and richness as possible so that we can update and modify our plans. I, I don't maybe like to in, in public that often, uh, I'll, and this is being broadcast, I'll, so it is quite public, but I'll say um, that it's useful to use uh, war planning metaphors, I think, when you go into a difficult period of time like this. I don't mean it to sound like a war. We really do want to reach an agreement with publishers, uh, including Elsevier, um, and we are working very hard to do that, and we're negotiating in good faith, and we have good relations with the other negotiators. But nonetheless, we're going into a situation where we are we broke up, we don't agree, and we're going to have impacts on our users. And it's very important to protect the civilians in wartime. Uh, you, you may be, the war may be good for a good purpose. This battle, this long-term goal of open access, we think is absolutely worthwhile, but people are going to be hurt. Their work is going to be slowed down, made more inconvenient along the way, and it's important to succeed long-term on the goal to do the best we can to protect our users along the way. And part of that is figuring out how well we are, they're being treated and how well we're helping them and improving that constantly. So there's again the URL for the toolkit. It's very easy to find. I uh, recommend it. Happy to always answer questions uh, directly while I'm here or uh, on email later on. And I think at that point, I turn it over to Colleen. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions to Jeffrey? Okay. Are we still asleep? No, we are awake. Okay, if there's no questions, and all is, is there a question here? Yes, Paiki. You'll see I hesitated to raise my head, but uh, I felt I should ask this. And it's rather difficult. Um, in, in this planning, uh, if you given thought to uh, uh, how much traffic possibly could be di uh, diverted to Sci-Hub, yeah. for instance, and uh, if you have given thought to that, what, what would be your comment on that? I'm sorry, I can only hear half of that. Could you repeat? I, no, my no, ears are plugged. I, I was saying the possibility that the cutoff will divert a bit of traffic to Sci-Hub. Oh, yes. And if you have given thought to that... Right. What would be your comment on that? Yeah, um, something that we're pretty sure about, uh, no big surprise here, is when I said that only 5 to 10% of demand seems to be going back to the libraries at, when people get cut off, um, we're all pretty sure that a fair bit of that is going to Sci-Hub, that people are going to Sci-Hub to get things. Uh, it's pretty well known now. There's a lot of evidence from IP traffic that people are going to Sci-Hub. So we anticipate that will happen. Um, it's, it's illegal in the U.S. There's absolutely no question it violates copyright law, and we're not going to support that. We don't recommend it. Um, we tell people that if they ask us that uh, we don't recommend it. Um, but we know it's happening. The publishers know it's happening. It's really it's out of our control. Uh, in fact, we do everything we can to prevent Sci-Hub from getting credentials to our library, which they try to do to steal articles. Uh, and occasionally, publisher, when it happens, the publishers shut us down until we find those credentials and shut those credentials down. So we don't support it, but we know it's there, and we know that's part of the reason that people are getting access uh, without having to go to the library. Hey, good morning. Uh, are you planning on monitoring any kind of impact it will have on the university system output? So, uh, you know, uh, in terms of citations, published articles, that kind of thing? Uh, if, if the cutoff is long enough, if we go without a contract long enough, that's certainly one of the things we'll measure. We do a lot of data collection on things like citations and publications and output, and we will be able to analyze that. Obviously, that would take some time before we'd notice an impact on that. Um, and again, uh, you know, it's sort of indirect. Some people, the, we're all librarians, so we know, we're losing access to reading, not to publishing. Some people think that UC authors won't be able to publish in Elsevier journals anymore. That's not true. Elsevier would love to have their articles, and we're not boycotting them. They're allowed to do that if they want to. But indirectly, if they can't get access to things, it could affect their research, and we will track that if it's long enough. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Another round of applause for Jeffrey.